Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter number 8, Joshua chapter number 8. While you're turning there, let's kind of move back to last week. And some of you might think, well, I don't really want to move back to last week. Um, I told a few people this week, if you start reading ahead, you'll know what's coming. And then you can decide whether you want to hear it or not, right? You can decide whether you want to come on Sunday. I am completely joking about that. Um, last week, you know, some told me, well, that was, that was a little rough. The reality is, though, God loves his people, so God sends warnings to his people. God loves us too much to let us destroy ourselves. Last week we saw Israel, they have just left Joshua chapter 6. I mean, they saw the walls of Jericho fall down. God did an amazing, a mighty thing, and and on the heels of that, they say, look, let's go after Ai, we'll send a few men. Well, let them spy out Ai. They, the spies come back to Joshua and they say, look, this is a small city. This is not a big deal. Send two or 3,000 men. Don't even wear out the whole army. So, of course, Joshua did. They sent these two or 3,000 men, and these two or 3,000 men retreated from before the people of Ai. 36 men were killed. They come back into the, into the camp. I'm sure if 36 were killed, there were probably some injured. So imagine they come back into the camp. They've got some on stretchers, some are hobbling. The whole army is, is not just defeated physically, but mentally and emotionally. They're, they're just wiped out. What just happened? Joshua being the leader, he and the elders of Israel, they literally ripped their clothes. They put dirt and, and ashes on their head, and they fell on their face before God. And Joshua starts to pray, God... What in the world? God, I mean, I thought you were going to do all these things for us, and here we're retreating from our enemies, and, 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 and the whole nation, the whole, the whole land of Canaan, all these tribes are going to hear about it, and, and what's this going to do for your great name? We saw last week, it's interesting how quick we are to blame God rather than to ask ourselves what maybe we've done wrong to cause this cries out to God, and God pretty much says to Joshua, Joshua, get off your face. Now's not a time to pray, Joshua. Now is a time to deal with sin. Someone in the congregation has touched, has taken the accursed thing, and because they've taken the accursed thing, they've become accursed themselves. Let's make the story short. God says, bring the tribes before you, and and I'll show you who it was. So, so Joshua brought the tribes, and out of the tribes, the tribe of Judah was taken, and then, then one family out of that, and a family out of that family. Finally, all the way down to one individual by the name of Achan, Joshua looks at him and says, Give God the glory. What'd you do? Achan said, It's true. I can't hide it. I saw a really nice shirt and some gold and some silver, and I took it, and it's hidden beneath my tent floor. It's, it's just hidden with all the rest of my stuff. They went to the tent, they found the gold, they found the silver. They brought it back to Joshua, and you know the end of the story. Achan and probably his entire family were stoned because of the accursed thing. It had, sin had to be removed from the camp. Sin had to be dealt with. That's chapter 7. Now we come into chapter 8. I want you to imagine Joshua as a leader. He has won the first major campaign, if you will, as a leader. He won the first big battle. And then he lost the second little one. Now, this is not my message today, but I think it's worth remembering. I think this is worth settling in your heart. Our greatest temptations will often follow on the heels of our greatest victories. Be very cautious when God wins a great victory for you and through you. In the high of that victory, the devil will attack. The enemy will come at you because he knows your guard's not up like it should be. On the heel of some of our greatest victories, our greatest temptations and our greatest failures will come. Here, Joshua is really responsible for this as the leader, but, you know, the whole congregation has failed. Can, can you imagine uh, as uh, they dealt with Achan now? So they've lost 36 men. There's 36 women probably without a husband. There's, there's all these kids with, without a father. The, the army feels defeated. Joshua feels defeated. Don't you think that the, the whole nation, especially though Joshua, especially the soldiers, probably felt like absolute failures? I mean, who am I to lead? Look at the mess I've already made. I'm sure Joshua, I'm sure the whole nation felt like absolute failures. The sin was dealt with, but the lingering effects in their, in their own minds, in their own hearts are still there. They feel like absolute failures. And can I be honest, from the very outset, they were. 
They were absolute failures. Not only had they lost this battle, but they had failed to seek God's guidance. They had suffered the consequences of individual sin that made the whole family, the whole nation responsible for God. They were major failures. But my whole point today is that chapter 7 isn't the end of the story. Chapter 7 wasn't the end of the story for the believing life, for the person that's truly trying to follow Jesus, there is always a chapter 8. If there are any areas this morning where you have failed, and I want to say even failed miserably. I mean, there's this one blot, maybe even nobody else knows about it on your life, and you just feel like that failure has rendered you absolutely useless before God. It's destroyed your fellowship with God. There's just no hope for the future. Let me say to you this morning, if you are sincerely Walking in repentance, if you have dealt with that sin, chapter 8 always follows chapter 7. God can and God will take our most miserable failures and turn them into marvelous triumphs. But only God can do that. Let's begin our reading in Joshua chapter 8 today. We're going to begin our reading in verse number 1. The scripture said, Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. Of course, Joshua is probably demoralized, defeated at this point. And God specifically says to him, Joshua, don't don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. The word dismayed, we've looked at this before because he mentioned this in Joshua 1, means to be discouraged or literally to break down. Joshua, don't have a breakdown because of what just happened. I mean, I can imagine that's basically where, where Joshua was at this point. In fact, after the men come back from Ai, and the 36 men have been killed, they've been defeated. Literally, we saw Joshua have a major breakdown right in front of us. And now God comes to Joshua and he says, Joshua, don't be discouraged, don't break down. To say our God is the God of second chances is so true, but I really think that's so inadequate. When we say that God is the God of second chances, completely true. But, but I want to say God is not just the God of, of second chances. God is the God of limitless and matchless grace. And the reason I say that, because second chances is a wonderful thing. But second chances are, are, is way too small for what God actually does. I was just thinking this morning, God gives me more chances than I deserve before I even get my first cup of coffee in the morning. Okay, so if God only gives second chances, then I'm still in trouble because I'm already done by 7 o'clock. God's not just the God of second chances. God is the, the God of limitless, matchless grace. God is the God who will forgive over and over and over and over and over. And if I went on saying that for an hour, I would not touch the end. I would not reach the end of what God does. Even after personal or collective failures, God can and will still restore the fortunes of his people. Notice he says in the text, See, I have given the land into your hand. Jehovah is unlike any other God in the, in the pantheon of deities. He forgives the breaking of his law. He stretches out his hand to those who have smacked it away. He gives the land to people who have given him nothing but grief. God is the God who will not hold confessed sin against his people. Your own heart may condemn you, the enemy may condemn you, but God does not hold a single repented of confessed sin against his people. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that he doesn't impute our sin to us. The word impute means take inventory of or think of. God is not sitting up there with a checklist thinking, oh, yep, they did that on May 28th. And they did that actually 10 times before 12 on May 28th. (laughs) And then on May 29th, wow, look at May 29th, woo. No, that's not the way God operates. When God's people come before him in confession and repentance, remember confession is agreeing with God, it's giving glory to God, it's saying, yes, God is right about my actions, God is right about my attitudes and I'm wrong, that's confession. Repentance is turning away from those things, turning to God, walking in righteousness. When God's people come before him in confession and repentance, God does away with the rap sheet. God's not taking inventory. 
But it's not just that God forgives and, and, and God forgets. God blesses people who have cursed him when they repent of their sin. God, as we looked at last week, removes the curse from his people. See, Joshua is defeated and discouraged. And God says, Joshua, don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. Yes, you failed. Yes, you got an F on the report card. You failed, but I will give you the land. He says, take all the people of war with you. Don't be arrogant this time, Joshua. Remember, just send two or three thousand. This is not going to be that big of a deal. And that's what they did. Joshua, this time, don't be arrogant. Don't assume that past victories will assure present victories. But Joshua, don't also assume that past failures will limit present success. Just because you have failed doesn't mean you have to spend the rest of your life failing. He says, I've given the king of Ai, I've given his people, I've given his city, I've given his land into your hand. There's nothing left out. I've given it all to you. No matter, Joshua, how miserably you failed last time, that does not limit what I can do and will do through you and for you this time. The difference with this time was God's presence. Verse number two. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, only its spoil and its cattle. You shall take his booty for yourselves. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. Now this is God's command here. I did notice this week, it's often been asked, why did God put that tree in the garden if they weren't allowed to eat of it? Right? Why did God do that? Now I don't have scripture for this, but I I do think, I know that God is a reasoning God. God has purpose in all that he does. I'm personally of the belief that that tree was not forever going to be limited off limits. It was off limits for that period. Now, you can argue with me on that, and really, neither one of us can say we're right or wrong, because Scripture doesn't say, but God did not just put that tree in the garden just to see if they would pass the test. God had some intentions that we're not aware of in the garden with that tree. I think that later there might have been a time that, that God took the restrictions off the tree. Yet Adam and Eve reached out early. I can't say that for sure, but what I can say here, Achan saw a a good Babylonian garment, a good shirt, uh, some silver and some gold, and he took it, and because of that, he became a curse because God said, don't take it. But notice here, God says, take whatever you want. All the spoils of war are uh, are yours. If Achan had only waited, he he could have had the same as what he got. And so much more, God would have provided for him. God would have given him more. And he would have still been alive. God is not withholding. But it's always in the right time. And that's God's time. Getting ahead of God can be a fatal thing. God says here, I told you not to take it in Jericho. But now take whatever you want. So verse number 3. So Joshua says in verse 2, you lay a trap. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. Verse 3, so Joshua rose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. First time Joshua took 3,000 men. This time he's sending 30,000 extra men. Now as we read the text, there's there's some confusion, if you will. If Joshua only sent 30,000 men, or if there was this one troop of 30,000 he sent besides all the others... There's another time that 5,000 is mentioned. We don't know exactly how many total were sent, but we do know that Joshua sends out this this 30,000-man commission late at night. Now, this is what I want you to notice. They chose out these 30,000 men. They sent them away by night. Joshua's not going to make the same mistake. I, I can say this. Failure actually can be a blessing sometimes. My pastor used to say, anything that humbles us is good for us. Joshua and the people of Israel have been humbled. They're not going to make the same mistake again. So Joshua sends out these 30 men and he instructs them in the the verses that follow. You take position somewhere hidden close behind the city. We're going to come and attack. And when they come out to fight against us, we're going to retreat. We're going to run away just like we did before. When they see us run, they're going to chase us down. They're going to think we're retreating. But of course, this is all going to be a trick, verse 6 tells us. While Joshua says to these these that he sent to hide behind the city, while they're chasing us away from the city, you're to make a surprise attack from behind the city. You're to seize control of the city, and you're to burn the city to the ground. Verse 7 says, Joshua tells the people, this plan is going to work because the Lord God will deliver it into your hand. Now remember, when they went against Ai the first time, they didn't consult God. This time, the plan is coming from God himself. God said, lay an ambush. 
We're going to attack the city. We're going to retreat while they're chasing us. You go in. You seize the city. You set it on fire just like God commanded us to. So Joshua and the men of Israel, they made camp on the north side of Ai, just beyond the valley that lay between Ai and, and, and their camp. And when they were certain that the ambush was set, Joshua led the army down into the valley in an attack formation. We pick up in verse number 14. Now it happened when the king of Ai saw it, he saw Joshua and the men advancing. The men of the city hurried and rose early and went out against Israel to battle. He and all his people had an appointed place before the plain. But he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. So just like the first time, they began to retreat, they began to run away. What happens? Verse 16. All the people who, who were in Ai, all the people in Ai were called together to pursue them. They said, look, they're retreating again. Let's, let's end this right now. And they pursued Joshua and they were drawn away from the city. Verse 17, there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. So they left the city open and pursued Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the spear that's in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that was in his hand toward the city. The whole city is open now. In fact, verse 17 said that they left the city open and pursued Israel. There's nothing to protect the city. I think what Joshua does here is probably some sort of signal commanded by God. He raises up the spear. Somehow those who are waiting in ambush see what's happening. And they go and they attack the city. Verse 19. Those in ambush rose quickly out of their place. They ran as soon as they had stretched out his hand. And they entered the city and took it and hurried to set it on fire. Let's read the last few verses. When the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended to heaven. So they had no power to flee this way or that, and the people who had fled to the wilderness turned back on the pursuers. Now when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. Verse 22 says, Then the others came out of the city against them, they were caught in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side, and they struck them down so that they let none of them remain or escape. Verse 23 tells us they captured the king of Ai. They brought him to Joshua. They chased down every one of the soldiers who fled, and, and they, they killed them. After taking care of the army, the, those who were out in the field returned to the city. They slew all the inhabitants, totaling about 12,000 people. And Joshua, verse 26, tells us, did not draw back his hand until the city was utterly destroyed. Verse 27 tells us the soldiers kept the spoil for themselves. Verse 28, so Joshua burned Ai and made it a heap forever, a desolation to this day. Verse 29 says, and the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until evening. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his corpse down from the tree, cast it at the entrance of the gate of the city, and raise over it a great heap of stones that remains to this day. I have one point, we read a lot of scripture this morning, but I really have one point that I want to make from the text, and it's simply this. Failure is not final. Failure is not final. You know, I was thinking this morning, in all my years in school, from elementary, middle school, high school, college, I can't remember ever getting one F. And that's just because I sit beside a lot of really smart people all the way through school. Y'all might get that later. Uh, the reality is, though, in life, there are times in this Christian journey, there are times when we, I don't even like to say we mess up, because that just really degrades what sin actually is. Sin is rebellion against God. But there are times that we fall flat on our face. There are times that, that we get a big F on the report card, and there's no way around it. I just want to encourage you this morning to remember, failure is not final. You may get a single F on a midterm, but that does not have to be your final grade. Sometimes I think that our failures are actually the keys that God uses to unlock the future. Now before I go any further, let me make it plain. As I'm talking about our failures, our sins, let me make it plain. No one should be okay with, no one should shoot for failure. It's not as if we should say, well, God's grace covers it all. Paul asked the question, should we sin that grace may abound? The answer is, God forbid. 
I'm not encouraging you this morning to, to not study, to not do the work, to not pursue holiness and sanctification. What I am trying to tell you this morning is when you do fail, and it will happen, when you do fail, we have an instructor who can and will use our failures even for future good. Failure is never our best look, but failure also doesn't have to be our last look. God can take even our most embarrassing retreats and turn them for inspiring progress. Only God can do that, though. Our God is so good, He never wastes anything, and that even includes our failures. One of the, just the, the magnificent, marvelous things about God is, is that He can't just uh, take good things and make them better. God can take the most ugly, the most wretched, the most horrible things and literally make beautiful, wonderful, attractive, awe-inspiring things out of them. It, it's, like a, it's like an artist who takes a, a hump of, of, of shredded, twisted metal and puts that metal together and makes a sculpture. That metal by itself is just, it's, it's ugly, it's hideous, it, it looks like it's been through an accident because it probably has, but in the hands of that artist, he can take that twisted metal and put it in the right shape and make something that let, lets you stand back and not only say, oh, that's beautiful, but it, you stand back and you say, man, what imagination, what beauty that comes from the artist. When we fail, when we twist, when we mutilate our own lives, I want to encourage you this morning that that's not the end of the story. Chapter 7 is not the end. There is a chapter 8. God can take our worst and produce His best through it. Our God is so good He doesn't waste anything, including our failures, in case there is any uncertainty. Let me clarify what I mean. I read all that scripture because I want you to get the picture. Remember when, when Israel attacked Ai the first time, they ran away in retreat. This time, God tells them, I want you to set an ambush behind Ai, and I want you to approach Ai just like you did before and retreat. When you retreat, they're going to follow you out, and then the men who have set the ambush are going to come in, they're going to take over the city, they're going to set it on fire. Imagine being the men of Ai. You think that this battle is already over. Man, you're chasing down the children of Israel. You think, here we go again. We, we killed a whole lot of them last time. Let's just finish it this time. They're chasing the children of Israel as hard as they can, and all of a sudden they smell smoke. And they look behind them and the whole city is on fire. And they realize that they've been, they've been caught in a trap. They have the forces of Israel on one side. They have 30,000 men on the other side. They're trapped. They're doomed. It's done. Israel closes in and wipes out the army. And any, anyone that got away through any little, any little valley or any little nook and crevice, the children of Israel, the, the army chased them down and slew them. And then they went and they destroyed the entire city. God took their ugly, God took their retreat and actually used it the second time to bring victory from it. In other words, God took their ugly and used the ugly thing itself to bring beauty into their lives. From our failures, God fashions keys for success, and that is a blessing. From our failures, God fashions keys to success, and that's a blessing because he has so much to work with. <laughs> When we talk about that twisted metal, God takes that twisted metal and brings beauty from it. Even, even all of our mountains of sin, all of our mountains of rebellion, it is a blessing because God has plenty to work with. An F has a way of waking a student up to know what they really need to learn. Now think about Peter. You remember Peter, Peter, bless his heart, he's like so many of us, he always wanted to speak. He didn't have a real knack for listening, but he had a knack for talking. And every time Peter opened his mouth, he said something ridiculous. Have you ever noticed that? Outside of one or two times, just about every time Peter opened his mouth, it was something ridiculous that came out. In Luke 22, the Lord said to Peter, he said, Peter, Satan has asked for you. Just like he did Job. Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But he said, Peter, I've been praying for you. And I'm praying that your faith won't fail. But then he says this, when you've returned, when you've been converted, I want you to strengthen the brethren. That's interesting because Peter, Jesus is speaking into the future here. He's given Peter a foresight that something's going to happen, Peter. You're going to fall flat on your face. But he said, when you do, when you go through the change that's necessary, then I want you to turn around and strengthen others. Of course, Peter said, Lord, not me. And we can laugh at Peter, but we're the same way. I would never do that. My kids are never going to fall that way, right? 
please, when it comes to your children, when it comes to yourself, never say never, okay? But Peter said, no, Lord. I mean, Jesus has just said to him, you're going to fall flat on your face, Peter. Peter said, you're mistaken. (laughs) Jesus, you don't know me like I know me. (laughs) Peter, you're going to fall flat on your face. Peter said, look, I am ready to go with you both to prison and even to death. I'll die. I'll go to jail for you, Jesus. I will die for you, Jesus. And then Jesus looks at Peter and he said, Peter, I'm going to tell you, before sunrise, it's already dark. It's probably already midnight at this point, right? And he says, Peter, in a few hours, you're going to deny you even know me. And you know exactly what happens later. Jesus is arrested and everybody leaves Jesus. And Peter's following somewhere off in a distance. And he's sitting around a fire with a a bunch of the enemies of Jesus. And this, this girl comes up to him and says, You were with, I've seen you before. You were with Jesus, that one from Galilee. Peter said, Nah, I've just got a really familiar face, right? (laughs) Not me. And then after he denied it before everybody, he says, look, I I don't know what you're talking about. You must be thinking about somebody else. Strike one. He went out to the gate and another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this guy, he was with Jesus of Nazareth. I remember he was the one always talking, right? While Jesus was trying to teach, he was the one always talking, Peter, again, with an oath this time, he he swore, I don't know that man. You're mistaking me. It's mistaken identity. A little later, there were several standing around, and and they said to Peter, you are one of them. Your speech, the way you talk betrays you. Peter got so angry that they accused him for being a follower of Jesus. He begins to stomp and snort like like a toddler, and he literally, he curses and he swears. He began to curse and he began to swear. I mean, he's talking as filthy as he can to make sure they don't know he's one of them. He said, I don't know that man. And immediately, cock a doodle do, <laughs> the roaster crew. That moment, Peter remembered the word of Jesus who'd said to him, before the, roaster crow, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. He gets his third, his third denial out. He's cursing, he's stomping, he's swearing up and down. He don't know it. And then cock a doodle do. <laughs> Peter's failure, though, I want you to see this. It's just an example. Peter's failure was actually the beginning of his road to spiritual success. Peter, it's obvious, was a, a proud man, a very proud man. He even told Jesus, You've got me all wrong. Peter was a proud man. It was in this moment of such terrible failure when he came face to face with the reality of his own sin nature. That's when Peter finally started beginning to change. It was only when he finally came crashing down that God was able to lift him up. Have you ever noticed? No, I know the Spirit came. I understand all that. But have you ever noticed that Peter was literally a different man after Pentecost, after the death, after the resurrection, after that denial? Peter was literally a different man when he stood up to speak in Acts chapter 2 than he was through all the Gospels. Have you ever noticed that? It's literally like you're looking at two different people. The way he talked, the way he walked was suddenly drastically different. Peter wasn't the same person. And I think that's because he had been to the school of failure and received an advanced degree. Failure may actually be one of the best things that ever happens to you because when you fall flat on your face, then you can begin to start looking up. That humility that's produced through failure prepares us to finally receive and cherish the grace of God. After his graduation from the school of failure, it was clear that that Peter, who was once self-absorbed, self-centered, self-focused, self-aggrandizing, Peter had a new focus. When he stands up to speak at Pentecost, he's not talking about Peter. He's talking about Jesus. Having let himself down, he was no longer so self-confident, but he had found a new, a surer confidence in the power of God, the power of God to redeem After Jericho, I'm certain that Israel was riding high. They probably felt invincible, even invulnerable. But it was that that invulnerability that actually made them vulnerable. Remember, he that thinks he stands, he needs to watch out. He needs to take heed because he's probably going to be the one that falls. They were so confident 
at Ai, they did not even ask God for directions. They just attacked. They assumed victory because they had just had it at Jericho. However, their massive mishap brought them to their knees. But better yet, it brought them to themselves. It was the glaring F after the A plus that revealed to Israel she still had so much to learn. Again, failure, both spiritually and physically, has a way of making us aware of our need for God. That's not the end. Failure is not the end. Failure is the beginning. A man or a woman who senses their need for God will be a, a dangerous force on the battlefield of faith. Notice all through the text we read, God said, I am going to give them to you. I'm going to do this. You just obey. Sometimes we have to fall flat on our face. Sometimes we have to get banged up and bruised up before we will ever hold His hand. But when we learn to hold the hand of God, when we learn to allow Him to direct our way, that, my friend, is all that's required for an A in the walk with Christ. In the Christian life, there is really only one lesson that has to be learned to get an A. And I really thought about this. Can I really say there's only one lesson that has to be learned to get an A? I think I can. In the Christian life, there's only one lesson that has to be learned to get an A, and that is the lesson of surrender and obedience. If you get that lesson right, all the other questions will be right as well. And that seems to be the lesson that Israel and that, that Peter learned after this event. Joshua read the law to the people. He, he re-inscribed the law on stone tablets and he read it to the people and the people rededicated themselves to God. You see, Israel failed miserably, but it was their failure that God used to position them for success, not just in the battle for Ai, but also in the battle for their own hearts. God is a redeemer and he will take our worst and even use our worst to produce his best. You know, stained glass windows, as beautiful as they are, they're just made up of hundreds and even thousands of pieces of broken glass. That's what they're made up of. God takes all the, the glass that we've shattered, all the vases that we've dropped, all the things that we've done in denying His name, all of our sins and our failures, and God brings them things, those things together and He, he makes a, a, stained glass, a stained glass trophy, if you will. And the beautiful thing about stained glass is it's pretty in itself, but it's when the light shines through that it becomes the most amazing, the most clear, the most radiant. What God does is He takes all the pieces that we have broken and he doesn't put them back together. No, he creates something totally new, something that reveals his glory. And as the light passes through, all people can stand back and say is how beautiful the mind of the Creator. He took Israel's retreat and he used it for their advantage. Their enemies were put to death. Their wealth was increased. God's forgiveness and God's faithfulness was proven. But notice the opportunity for success here. It came not from success, but from failure. God is a master artist. He paints his most beautiful pieces on canvases of life using ashes. And only God can do this. God literally brings beauty from ashes. And you might be sitting there thinking, what about my past? I can't serve God because there's something in my past. Even if everyone else doesn't know about it, I know about it. There's something in my past that leaves me unusable to God. Can I say to you, it's your past that makes you usable to God. You are a living object of the grace and the mercy of God because God can say, if I can use him, if I can use her, I can use anybody, I can literally take the stained glass pieces and make something completely new out of it and get glory from what they shattered. God will take our mess and give us a ministry from it. Have you ever thought that, now I'm, I'll, I'll address this in a minute, but I'm not saying go see and go crazy and see what God can do. <laughs> But have you ever thought that, that maybe your sin and the lessons that you learned from it and that grieving your own sin and the humility it brought in your life will give you an opportunity to teach somebody else not to make that same mistake? God will take our retreat and use it to advance His kingdom. If you place your failure in His hand, you will be surprised at what kind of functional and beautiful things He can make from a pile of twisted past transgressions. Let me make one thing plain now before, before I close. Let me make one thing plain. I don't want you to misunderstand me. Failure is not a thing to celebrate. 
<laughs> I'm not telling you to leave here today saying, I got an F. <laughs> That's not very smart. <laughs> Somebody told me one time they were bragging to me about how they got a big disability check because of how low their IQ was. And I thought to myself, you know, if you're bragging about that, you probably deserve the check. <laughs> I'm not telling you to leave here today saying, say, I got a whole pile of Fs for God to work with, and I'm going to make a few more. It's <laughs> not what I'm saying. I'm not saying to celebrate your F's. I'm saying to, to celebrate the God who can take an F student and make an A student. You see, I do want to say that F's are not a necessary part of our progress. You don't have to be an F student. You might not be an A student, but you don't have to be an F student. And let me warn you further, God, I, I wrote this a while back in a situation I was dealing with. God, our God, brings beauty from ashes. There's no doubt about that. But brothers, please be careful not to set things on fire just to give him something to work with. Look, if a kid plays with matches, he's going to burn the house down. And now, God can take and he can take those ashes and, and paint something beautiful. But the best thing was if the kid had never touched the matches. Right? The better thing than a, than a beautiful canvas that's painted with ashes and, and something beautiful is a house that's still standing. God brings beauty from ashes, but brothers, please be careful, sisters, please be careful not to set things on fire just to give him something to work with. A masterpiece painted with ashes is good, but a house that never burnt down is far better. These 36 men that were killed at Ai, they were never regained. They were lost. Right, these, these fatherless children now and these husbandless wives. And, and even think about Achan and, and himself and his whole family. All that Israel lost was never regained. Again, can I just stress, I'm not saying break things just to see how good God is at gluing things back together. I'm not saying that. Don't break things just so God can fix them. But I do want to tell you, the good news is, the magnificent news is, the beautiful news is that when we do break them, God can and will fix them. Do you have, and I, I can say I do. I'm not going to go into any detail, but I've got some real ministry failures that I think about a lot. Do you have any ministry failures? Do you have any moral failures? I want to tell you, when you bring those things before God, His word is, don't be dismayed. I will give you the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. When the devil, and I say when, not if, when the devil whispers in your ear, you failed. You can't be effective in the kingdom of God. Remember, he is right about you, but he's wrong about Jesus. Jesus uses failures because then all the glory goes to him. I was thinking in every message, I always try to think, okay, where does the gospel fit here? How do I tie this directly? No matter what Old Testament passage or New Testament passage I'm preaching on, we're a gospel. We want to be a gospel-centered people. So, so what does this have to do with the gospel? What does this have to do with Jesus? Where does the gospel fit in? And you know what? I, I kept trying to think, what unique tie does this have to the gospel? And then it dawned on me, this is the gospel. Through the work of Christ, God is redeeming. He is restoring what we have broken. As in Achan, the whole extended family fell. As in Adam, we were all sentenced to death. So in Christ, we are all made alive. But that's not the end of the gospel. Yes, there is justification, but there is also sanctification. There is the act where we are declared righteous before God, but there is also the act where God begins to remake us and reshape us to look like His Son, Jesus. You see, not only are we given life through Christ, we are given the land through Christ. And I mean this both symbolically and literally. Symbolically, victory, just like Israel had victory over Canaan, we have victory over sin through Christ. But literally, I want you to see this. Just as Israel had failed, and then God even used their failure to give them the land, in the same way God gives the land to his people in spite of our failures. Think about this. God, I, I've already said this, God doesn't just take the vase and glue it back together. God makes something whole new, wholly new with the pieces. Think about what God is doing in the world. He is not just making 
the same thing over. God is making a better thing. One day, God has told us in His Word that He is going to come to live on earth rather than just walking with us momentarily in the cool of the day in the garden. What God intends to give us is actually better than what Adam and Eve had before the fall. God is literally going to move in and He is going to move out the, the possibility of any future sin. I want you to see this. God is literally going to give us the land that we lost through our sin. God's going to give us the land and God is going to take our ugly and bring beauty from it. Adam and Eve had a wonderful privilege to literally walk with God in the cool of the day in the garden. But then they sinned. They lost that. Man was whole, the whole race was plunged into iniquity. But what God is going to bring out of their retreat is God is going to bring a marvelous advancement to where, no, we don't go back to the garden where we can walk with him for an hour a day. We're going into a garden to a whole new world where God will come and live with his people every minute of every day. God's giving the land to his people. He's taken our ugly. He's brought beauty from it. God takes our defeats. He produces victory even through our defeats. If your defeat does nothing more than humble you, then God will use that because it's that humility that prepares you to really receive his grace. He is taking our defeats. He is producing victory through it. He will take our fall and raise us up from the slums to sit with him on thrones of gold. God picks up the pieces of the things we broke. And instead of putting them back together, he makes something new, something more usable, something far better, something far more beautiful. Again, I say to you, F is for failure. But I want you to understand this. F may be for failure, but G always follows F. And G is for grace. There is chapter 7, but there's also chapter 8. To those who, maybe you know, I don't know, you've shamefully retreated in some way, I want to say to you, don't be discouraged. And it's not just me saying this to you, this is God saying this to you. Don't be discouraged. I'll still give you the land, and I'll even use your retreat to make it possible. I will... Take your retreat and use it to advance my purposes, my desires, and my kingdom. Do you have any dark spots? God can not only wash those dark spots away, but God can use those retreats to shape you into the man or the woman you need to be to be used to advance his kingdom. F may be for failure, but G always follows F, and G is for grace. For every chapter 7, there is a chapter 8, and for that we thank God. Will you pray with me? Lord, I pray now that you'd take your word and that you'd use it in the hearts of your people. Lord, I do thank you for your grace. And, and every time I think about it, every time I preach, every time I sing about your grace, I'm, I'm amazed. I, I'm literally amazed by it. Because, Lord, we're not near as gracious as you are. And we do hold on to sins that people have committed against us. But, Lord, you're a God who, who casts them back behind your back. They're separated as far as these from the west. They can't ever be found. You choose to not remember those things anymore. God, I have no doubt that there are people who are sitting here and constantly they tell themselves, the enemy tells them that, that they're unusable, they're unworthy, they're all of these things. Lord, I pray to you just through this simple little lesson how, how you use Israel's retreat to bring about victory. I pray that you'll show them that you can take their dark spots. And you can not only wash those dark spots and make them clean, but you can use those things to reshape them, to remold them, to make them like Jesus, and to make them a usable force in the kingdom of God. God, I, I sincerely thank you that you don't put the pieces back together and then there's all these little crack lines where you, you can see you've glued it and you've, you've tried to make it work. God, I, I, I thank you and I appreciate that you make something totally new out of the shattered pieces. Lord, you make something, something beautiful, something unimaginable out of the twisted metal that we leave behind. God, I pray now that you would do your work in this time of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we say together that the grace of God really is amazing? I mean, it really is. It really is. You might not ever see it in this life. Lindsay calls this second sermon. <laughs> you might not ever see this in this life, how God works it all out. But God will take the dark spots. 
God will not only wash them, but he will use them to transform you into his humble son, like his humble son, Christ Jesus. I have no doubt there are people sitting here this morning in this room, and you struggle constantly. Because the devil tells you everything you can't do. Your own heart tells you everything you can't do because of sin in your past. If our hearts condemn us, though, God's greater than our hearts. The grace of God can take all that and make something new and something beautiful. I'm certain, and I say I'm certain because even in the number that's here this morning, I'm always aware that there are people sitting here that you are not trusting Jesus. You think because you're here this morning, that punches your ticket. It's not true. It's not true. The grace of God in Christ Jesus, Jesus died to reconcile us to the Father. Outside of the death of Jesus, we have no way of being reconciled to God. And if you're here this morning and you're thinking anything else is going to reconcile you to God but Jesus, you're wrong. But to that, I do want to also say, but Jesus can and will reconcile you to the Father. There is a way. Quit making your own way and take God's way. If you're here this morning and you don't know, you're not trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone... I tell you the same thing that was told to Spurgeon on the night of his conversion. Look. Look to Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus and live. During this time of invitation, I want you to respond to God. Now, I say this every week, and I will continue saying it every week because I know human nature. Some of you, week in and week out, you sit through this invitation, you listen to the song, and you leave. That's not what this time is for. This time is now to respond to God personally. You can do that in your seat. You can do it here at these steps. You can do that wherever. This is not just a time now to, to sit and listen. This is a time to speak back to God for what he has spoken to you. In this time of invitation, if you don't know Jesus, now is the time to trust him. In this time of invitation, if you know Jesus, but you've got some shattered pieces, now is the time to place them in his hands, repent, and move forward. If you need me to pray with you, I'd be happy to meet you at the front and pray with you. Dear, as this song plays, you do business with God as God has worked in your heart.